I thought I'd sort of take a somewhat different uh, tack today and um, try to talk a little bit about what I think the biggest single uh, philosophical question in all these uh, startups, and maybe even in life generally, is that people have. And it's, um, it's whether, uh, is it all just a matter of luck, or how much of this is luck, and how much is, is, is not luck when you start one of these businesses and, 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 and do, do one of these things? And it's sort of this big question that underlies a lot of, uh, a lot of these uh, different ventures that people do. And I want to I try to tackle that uh, question, at least indirectly today. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, a little bit about um, the question of luck, um, why it's very hard to answer. I want to suggest to you that we live in a society where uh, people are incredibly biased to thinking that things are dominated by luck, and I want to at least suggest that there are some alternate ways of, uh, of thinking about the future that it's, it's worth for us to, to explore. Um, let, me, uh, let me start with, uh, this is probably sort of my, my general, uh, my, the general uh, slide that I always have on the nature of progress, the nature of the future, um, and when, when you think about how the 21st century is going to unfold, you can think that there are basically two axes to the 21st century. There's a technology axis and a globalization axis. Um, they're, they're very different. People always use these words interchangeably. But uh, globalization is basically about copying things that already work. Uh, it's the story of China and the emerging world. Um, they, they're still, you know, much of the world, six billion out of seven billion people are still incredibly poor. And what they mainly have to do in the next few decades is uh, just copy things that work. There's some things where they can avoid copying bad ideas from, from the developed nations, but a lot of it is this sort of horizontal or extensive progress uh, and sort of going from one to n. But then there's also uh, technology, doing new things, vertical or intensive progress, and it's sort of where you're the first uh, person or business or inventor or artist uh, in the history of the world to do, to do something new. It's going from, from zero to one. And what I want to suggest is that there's, there is something sort of very different about going from um, zero to one um, instead of one to n. One to n, is, there sort of is this law of large numbers, and you can sort of run the experiment many times and sort of see how things work. But you, when you go from zero to one, there's a sense in which, you know, every, uh, every sort of event in the history of progress, in the history of technology or science, has something singular and non-repeatable about it. And so, um, and so if we ask, you know, is a given invention, a given startup, a given artistic achievement, um, was this something that would have happened anyway? Is it something that was a total fluke? Um, it's actually a really hard question to answer because uh, you only have sort of um, a sample size of, uh, of one to go on. You, know, you can sort of, you can sort of uh, say that, that uh, with a sample size of one, you know, um, the variance becomes infinite, so it's almost impossible to know whether you were lucky or not. And I think that's probably uh, this sort of important starting point to have is that uh, um, it's completely unclear whether or not um, it's luck or not. And uh, you can have certain biases on this, but uh, in, in anything where you're going from zero to one, it's very, very hard to say. Now, um, there certainly is some very mild anecdotal evidence that, uh, that you can give that, uh, that certain um, that the anti-luck argument is that there are certain people who've succeeded in um, doing various uh, um, b businesses on a repeat basis. You know, there's you know, probably, perhaps most famously still Chief Steve Jobs with, you know, Apple and Pixar. You know, Jack Dorsey with Square, Twitter. My, my colleague Elon from PayPal who went on to start SpaceX and Tesla and was heavily involved in Solar City. Uh, of course, you know, there's always a counter-narrative with these things. So you can say, well, this person just, each of these people had just one big breakthrough and then everything else was somehow leveraged off of that. And so, you know, whenever you sort of drill down on this question, was it luck, was it not luck, it's actually, um, it's actually really hard, it's really hard to say. 
It is striking, however, how much the way we talk about this has changed. And so if you go, um, you know, if you go uh, back in time, the classical way people used to talk about it was that uh, luck was something to be overcome or to be mastered. So, you know, Thomas Jefferson, I'm a great believer in luck and I find the harder I work, the more I have of it, which again suggests that it's, it's, this, uh, it's this thing to, um, uh, to overcome or to, uh, um, um, you know, that's, uh, that doesn't dominate things. Or, you know, even simpler uh, Samuel Goldwyn, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Um, very much in contrast to that, you have something like uh, today's dominant uh, view where success stem stems from sort of this whole context. The context is random. You know, maybe you were a member of the Lucky Sperm Club, the Lucky Egg Club. You know, you were lucky where you were born and stuff like that. And that sort of is what, what drives everything. And there's, of course, you know, a version of this that applies to startups that, uh, you know, the, the successful ones um, were accidental. Um, you know, it's pretty clear how big a role luck plays. I agree with Paul Graham on an awful lot of things, but, but again, I, I think this is sort of a place where it's just automatically channeling our, uh, our default uh, uh, bias as a society, and it's, it's worth asking uh, how much of this is true and how much is, is not true. Um, what I want to focus on today is, um, is not so much um, there always are two different directions you can go with this question of luck. One is sort of the past orientation, which is, you know, how did I get here? You know, what were the factors that contributed to, uh, to success? Um, but I want to focus instead, um, instead I want to focus on the future question of, uh, of what, you know, what you can do next and where you go, where you go from here. Is this, um, is there sort of, uh, is, is, and is the future, um, is, is that something that's uh, fundamentally dominated by chance or is somehow thinking of this as being dominated by chance um, uh, somewhat of, a, uh, somewhat of a, uh, a wrong way or an incomplete way to think about the future? And I want to offer the alter an alternate perspective on that. Now, I want to say a little bit about the structure of the future and how people can think about the future. And, um, and you can think of it, I think, most simply as being determinate or indeterminate. And in particular, I have the sort of two by two matrix for the future. It's sort of a consulting type, type idea. But uh, you can basically, um, most simplistically, you can say that uh, the future is either optimistic or pessimistic and it's either determinate or indeterminate. Um, an optimistic future is one where you believe things will be better than the present on whatever axis defines better. Uh, a pessimistic future is one where you think things will generally be worse. And then a determinate future is one where you can sort of map out reasonable amounts of it and, and plan against it. And then an indeterminate one is, uh, is where you have absolutely uh, no clue and it's sort of just um, a random walk all the way. Uh, certainly, depending on which of these quadrants you believe is basically correct about the future, it tells you some very different, it leads to some very different approaches that you'd pursue in terms of how you think about your life or, or the kinds of things you're doing. And I wanna sort of try to develop this framework a little bit more um, as, we, as, we, as we think about this. So for example, um, most simply, um, a determinate versus indeterminate axis. Um, you know, if you believe the future is determinate, um, you will act with, uh, with uh, some degree of conviction, you'll have specific ideas, and you'll have some confidence to, uh, to, uh, to work towards those ideas. Um, if it is indeterminate, um, the number one rule is to diversify because you have no idea what's going to work and you should just try lots of different things and you should have some sort of a portfolio approach uh, to the future. Um, and so I think one of the things that's always very interesting when you think of this determinate versus indeterminate thing is that there are all these things that ultimately become self-fulfilling. So if you 
if you think it's determinate and then you focus on doing one thing extremely well, that sort of leads to conviction and then maybe that becomes self-fulfilling. If you think that it's fundamentally indeterminate, you end up with a portfolio approach, it's diversified, and it has maybe that itself becomes self-fulfilling and becomes um, somewhat indeterminate, uh, and it becomes more indeterminate in a way. Um, there's, of course, um, you know, on the optimistic versus pessimistic axis, um, the simple one is just, you know, are you fundamentally afraid of it? Do you think it's fundamentally something that's uh, going to be better? And this, these, these sorts of uh, perspectives also um, lead to very different ways to act. If you, want to, if you want to put this in sort of a historical context, I think that um, I'm going to try to develop, uh, explain why I put these different zones in these quadrants. But I think the US in the 50s and 60s, and maybe even before then, was fundamentally optimistic and determinate. The future was clearly going to be better. People thought that every generation was going to be better off than the generation that came before. And it was, for the most part, in very specific ways. There was a, um, there was a determinate way in which the frontier was going to be developed. There was a way that uh, you know, cars would get faster, planes would get faster, rockets would get faster. Uh, there were sort of all these very uh, specific ways that uh, the future would uh, get better from year to year and decade to decade. Uh, I think um, there's sort of a very different paradigm that the U.S. had for a quarter century from 1982 to 2007, where the future was going to be better. That was the official religion. It was still um, sort of very optimistic, but uh, if you asked how or why, people had no good answer for it. And so it was just this, uh, this mechanistic thing that would automatically uh, get better in one form or another. And so we were sort of in this quadrant of extreme um, indeterminate optimism, I would say, for about a quarter of a century from the period of 82 to 2007. Um, indeterminate pessimism is probably what characterizes most of the rest of the, the developed world. Uh, I would say Japan's been in this zone for, um, for the, last, uh, the last 20 years. People have a sense the future is going to be not that great, maybe a little bit worse, and nobody has an idea of what to do. And I think sort of Europe has weirdly drifted into this indeterminate pessimistic quadrant as well, where people think the future's worse, but nobody has any idea what to do. Um, you can sort of argue where you put China on this. Uh, some people would put it in the determinate optimistic quadrant. Um, I, I tend to put it on the uh, determinate pessimistic quadrant. It's very determinate. People in China have a, they know what it's going to look like in 20 years. They're going to build out the highways and the cities. Um, and for the most part, it's, it, I think it is going to be a somewhat poorer version of the developed world. People will get old before they get rich. There's a very specific way to, to track against that. But um, um, China comes out on this quadrant that's very different from the US 82 to, to 2000, uh, 2007. If you, um, if you think of these quadrants in terms of, um, in terms of uh, um, the sort of a financial way you could describe this, which is that uh, if you're optimistic, you don't need to save a lot of money. If you're pessimistic, you save a lot of money. So if you're super optimistic, you know the future is going to be better. There's no need to save any money. And so you end up with a savings rate that's, uh, that's um, very low. If you include a government borrowing in the US today, the US savings rate today stands at minus 6%. So we're still incredibly optimistic about the future. We don't need to save any money because the future will automatically be better. And so we're still maybe in an Indian summer of indeterminate optimism. Um, on the other hand, for example, I would describe China as quite pessimistic because it has a savings rate of something close to um, 30, 30% 30 of GDP gets saved. And so people, um, even though there's some ways in which things are getting better from year to year, people still think they'll be um, old before they get rich, and therefore they need to save a lot of money. So you have this low savings to high savings um, axis from optimism to pessimism. And then if you sort of, and that's like investing in cash or bonds or things like that, um, 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 saving in cash or bonds or things like that. Um, if you invest in specific things, there's specific uh, companies, buildings, ideas you invest in, 
Um, if you have a definite determinate view, you'll have a high investment rate. If it's indeterminate, um, you will not know what specific things to invest in, and so you'll end up with a low, low, investment, um, low investment rate. And so, um, so one of the strange things about um, indeterminate optimism is that it's the quadrant that has both low savings and low investment. And the question I will come back to towards the end is whether that's a, sta that's, whether that's a stable quadrant at all. Is it possible for the future to be better when no one saves and no one invests because no one's thinking and everyone's outsourcing all the thinking to other people? Um, one of the other ways you can sort of describe this difference, um, I want to sort of give a few different axes for describing this shift from determinate to indeterminate ways of the future. The mathematical version is that uh, the dominant form of mathematics used to be calculus, and it's shifted to probability and statistics. Uh, the, um, the structural way is that in a determinate world, you're focused on substance. There are some specific substantive things you focus on. In an indeterminate world, um, all that you end up focusing on are processes. And so what people talk about in our world is, what's the process for doing thing, something much more than what is the specific thing you're trying to do. To talk about specific things is too definite, and that seems too, uh, too, uh, too, weirdly, um, too weirdly wrong. In practice, you can sort of think of these very different types of quadrants that dominate. The indeterminate optimistic world is dominated by finance and law because these are the kinds of process-oriented disciplines that, uh, that you pursue if you have no idea about the future, if it's fundamentally about making sure that the, uh, the piping of the system works, but you have the sense the system just uh, sort of works automatically. Uh, in a determinate optimistic world, um, that's probably a world in which there's much more room for engineering, art, you know, very specific things. It's people who have ideas about the future that are radically different from the present. It's people who have dreams about the future that nobody else shares and that they're you know, willing to work towards and where the dreams of a substantively different and radically better world are not subsumed towards some sort of random process. Um, you know, determinate pessimistic would be wartime rationing. You know, indeterminate pessimistic, um, all you end up doing is buying insurance. I've, um, I've spoken in some context about uh, there being a bubble in education, and I think you can think of the education bubble as a form of um, in, indeterminate pessimism where people are, um, they don't really know what the education's for, but it's fundamentally acts as an insurance policy to avoid falling through the uh, larger and larger cracks in our society. Uh, and so anyway, you can sort of think about these different quadrants and depending on which one dominates, there's sort of very different kinds of industries that, uh, that end up dominating. You know, to have a picture of what definite optimism or determinate optimism looked like, um, you know, we can, um, we can go back to these classic examples from, um, from U.S. history. So there are things like, uh, like the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad in the, uh, in the 19th century. Uh, where you know, it was a radically different future where uh, the world you know, would be connected. It's a gigantic undertaking by today's standards. Nobody would do it. People would say, why are you building this railroad to nowhere? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's costing too much money. Um, um, but somehow, as it was built, the future sort of took care of itself. Uh, you know, the classic mid-20th century example I always like to cite is, uh, is Robert Moses, who was this uh, um, some, somewhat uh, forgotten figure. He was probably the most important person in, in New York, uh, more powerful than the mayor or the governor of uh, New York City, New York State, respectively, for about a quarter century. He started by becoming the uh, parks commissioner. He ended up having 17 different positions in government. Um, and he sort of show up with his bulldozer and build parks and level some neighborhoods and build some highways so people could have access to the parks. He built all the sort of roadways on Long Island, the FDR Expressway, and there was sort of you know, one thing after another that uh, got rebuilt. It sort of stopped in the mid-1960s when he uh, planned to build a highway connecting Brooklyn and New Jersey. It was going to go through the southern end of Manhattan. They were going to sort of raise Greenwich Village to the ground. Uh, the neighbors sort of objected. 
uh, they, start, they started saying, we're not quite sure that the future actually is any better than the present. It was going to be this highway with sort of skyscrapers right on top of the highway. And, um, and it, it, sort of, it sort of stopped. And at that point, people basically, uh, you know, and once there was no longer a definite view of the future, um, you also ended up with a place where people stopped building things in New York. And so um, it's possible that Moses was very wrong, that most of the things were misdirected, but it did have this sort of powerful coordinating function. And, uh, and once the um, idea of the future disappeared and people no longer believed that there was a future that, was, that looked very different from the present and that was radically better than the present, um, people stopped being able to build anything and nothing new in an infrastructure sense has been built in New York State for close to half a century on any meaningful scale. Um, again, to sort of illustrate how different past ideas of the future were for those of, those, those of you familiar with the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, there was this thing called the Rubber Plan uh, uh, in sort of the late 1940s. It was a plan to basically build two large earth and rock fill dams. One was between Marin County and Richmond, the other between San Francisco and Oakland. It was gonna turn um, the North Bay and the South Bay into two giant freshwater lakes. There'd be 20,000 acres of new landfill. There's gonna be a 32 lane highway built around the entire Bay Area. Um, and you'd have sort of 30 story skyscrapers built around the entire San Francisco Bay. Um, you know, Reber was sort of a school teacher, amateur theater producer, but in the world of the 1950s, um, this idea was taken seriously enough that you had congressional hearings, there was, you know, a giant mock-up of the plan, it was concluded there would be too much evaporation and it wouldn't quite work, and so people sort of uh, gave up on it after a while. Um, but again, you cannot even imagine someone, um, someone who's a school teacher, an amateur theater producer, being able to um, have a, a plan to just re-engineer um, a huge geographical area like this and, uh, and, change, uh, and change the world in a, in a radical way. This is, again, sort of where we're in this uh, world that's extremely different from the world of just 50 or 60 years ago. Um, and of course, you know, all the classic, uh, all the classic versions of uh, science fiction, cities underwater, cities on, the moon, cities on Mars, cities in outer space, sort of radically different um, and very definite ideas of the future that would sort of become self-fulfilling prophecies of one sort or another. Um, and when you sort of look at these uh, pictures today, these things look, they don't look futuristic, they look dated. They look like uh, they, look like they really are um, sort of from the past which is uh, sort of a, again, sort of this very strange way in which things have changed. Um, you know, the classic, uh, by contrast, the classic version of indefinite optimism is uh, portfolio investing theory. Um, it is that uh, you should invest in a, um, in a stock market index. That's the way you get the highest risk-adjusted returns because the motion of um, stocks is like the movement of atoms in the universe. It's fundamentally random, and uh, we can't know anything about it. We can just actually, we can maybe describe the laws, the statistical laws that describe the randomness, but uh, what specific stocks or specific companies or specific projects um, you should invest in, you can never know. Um, and, uh, but you know the stock market generally moves in a, um, in a northeasterly direction, and therefore um, the most important thing is to find the way to get maximum diversification at minimum cost and, uh, and do something like a, a, a portfolio investing. Um, you know, in this shift, one of the strange things that happens in this shift from definite to indefinite views of the future is that there is this shift from engineering to finance. And, uh, and, uh, and one of the things that happens is that money somehow becomes much more important. And sort of the soundbite version of this is, um, in a definite world, money is a means to an end because there are specific things you want to do with money. In an indefinite world, um, you have no idea what to do with money, and so money simply becomes an end in itself, uh, which seems always a little bit perverse. You just accumulate money, and uh, you have no idea what to do with it. That seems sort of like a bit of a crazy thing to do, but uh, I think that's actually what, uh, what happens a great deal. And so to, 
illustrate one way that this flow might happen. Um, if you, you know, start a successful business, um, you know, you sell the company or you sell shares to investors in an IPO, you make some money. Question, what do you do with the money? You have no idea because nobody knows what to do with anything. And so you give the money to a large bank to help you do something. What does the bank do? It has no idea. So it gives the money to a portfolio of institutional investors. What do the institu each institutional investor do? They have no idea. Um, um, and so they all just invest in a portfolio of stocks. Not too much in any single stock ever, because that suggests you have opinions or you have ideas. And that's very dangerous, because it suggests that uh, you're somehow not with it. And then what do the companies do that get the money? They've been told that all they should do is generate free cash flows. Um, because if they were to actually invest the money in specific things, that would suggest the companies had ideas about the future, and that would be very dangerous. And so one of the worst things you can ever have is a company that's, uh, that's not profitable um, in, in, in this indefinite world. And sort of the, the contrarian idea that I always like saying is that uh, we always like investing in companies that are losing money. We don't like investing in companies that are making money because the companies that are not profitable are actually the companies that have a lot of ideas about what to do with their money. Um, whereas a company that's massively profitable, on some level, is a company that's out of ideas. Um, and it's especially crazy in a world where, um, where the interest rates are zero and you actually get paid less and less on the money. And then, of course, so the companies are profitable, they generate cash flows, the cash flows eventually go back to people, and you sort of cycle and repeat. And this is sort of, um, this is the rough flow that happens in the world of indefinite optimism. Um, the problem is, um, you know, it's somewhat of a, you know, this is a bit of an extreme picture, but in effect, it's a hermetically closed loop. And uh, at the end of the day, um, no one's doing anything real with the money. It's completely abstracted. Um, and what ends up happening is there are fewer and fewer things you can do. And, um, and one, of the, uh, one of the sort of financial ways to illustrate this um, is if you look at the uh, real interest rates on 10-year uh, bonds in the US, which is, this is a measure of how much interest do you earn on bonds uh, minus um, what the expected inflation rate is. And um, it's basically been trending steadily downwards. Today, it's at minus 0.6%. So 10-year bonds are yielding about 2%. Um, the expected inflation for the next decade is 2.6%. So when you invest in bonds, in real terms, you're expecting to lose minus 0.6% a year for, for a decade. Um, and it's, this shouldn't even be surprising because there's no one in the system who has any idea what to do with the money. Um, this has been sort of a consistent uh, critique of the uh, huge deficits the US is running. People constantly are saying, you know, there's a point where the bond market is going to blow up and the interest rates will go higher. And one of the really big mysteries is that this has not happened for year after year. And I think the, the, fundamental, um, the fundamental reason this has not happened is that uh, people actually have no idea what to do with the money. The, the last big idea people had on what to do with uh, money that was not sort of circular was to buy houses and to invest in housing. And that was sort of the, the idea of the last decade. That idea has gone out of fashion. Now that um, people no longer want to buy houses, they have absolutely no ideas what to do with money. The interest rates, the real interest rates, are going steadily more negative. Um, and so there's some sense in which this uh, system of indefinite optimism is, um, is uh, gradually um, uh, sort of running out. Uh, there's a way in which um, um, you know, one, the, the natural drift is for something uh, from um, finance to insurance. Um, I, I tend to always, I'm, I'm not going to give my whole uh, anti-Warren Buffett uh, lecture here, but I think, I think there's a way in which Buffett was prescient and ahead of the curve and uh, basically reoriented most of his businesses towards insurance companies in disguise, which is sort of the world of indefinite pessimism, and that's what, what dominates in that sort of world. And we can sort of see how this indeterminacy uh, affects us in very, very many different fields. So if we look at uh, politics, in an indeterminate world, um, the most important position in politics is the pollster. And what do you do in politics? Nobody has a clue. But what you do is you take a poll, um, and, um, and the polls tell you what to do. 
They don't really tell you anything on a long-term basis, but they sort of tell you incrementally what you do at any, um, any given time. And, uh, and as we've tracked towards this more and more indeterminate world, there's a way in which you know, poll taking has become more and more uh, dominant. And so the way we talk about um, political campaigns and uh, elections is sort of how are people doing in the polls much more than what ideas they're talking. It's sort of, you know, if Martin Luther King were here and said, I have a dream about a future that's really different, um, you know, the question would be, how does that poll? Um, it, uh, it would never, it, and, and that's sort of the way we avoid this. There obviously are cases where this goes very badly wrong. My, my sort of exhibit A, and my apology to all the Sarah Palin fans in the audience here, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, people always say it's this incredible mystery why McCain picked Palin in 2008. I, I think it's not a mystery at all. Um, the basic uh, heuristic was that you, uh, you looked at all the Republican senators and governors, in 2008, Republicans weren't very popular. They were mostly running around 40% in the polls. Uh, Palin was at 85% in Alaska because um, when oil was $140 a barrel, Alaska was like Kuwait. Everybody was getting huge checks from the government of the state of Alaska. She was polling extremely well. And so um, there was no question that you would go with uh, the person who polled the highest. And so you went with, uh, you went with Palin, even though perhaps um, it couldn't scale to the U.S. as a whole because the U.S. was um, not producing way more oil than it was consuming. Um, and so, you know, and then there's sort of our ways in which, you know, the 2012 uh, re-election gets recast as a contra contest between, say, Nate Silver and Dick Morris. Silver was a better poll taker, and so he won, rather than that Obama had better ideas or the ideas resonated better or that's what people wanted to hear. Um, it's not the substantive way that we talk about politics. Um, to talk about government more generally, um, you know, um, even though government spending is still about the same as it has been for the last uh, 50 or 60 years as a percent of GDP, more and more of it is shifted towards transfer payments, which are, of course, a way of saying that the government has no ideas on what to do with the money. It simply moves it to other people, and people, it's assumed that the people have ideas, but you don't have specific ideas of what to do. Uh, there's a way in which you can see indeterminacy in literature. And sort of if you sort of take uh, some you know, classic science fiction, you know, the uh, you know, 1960s space odyssey classic, you know, the text was updated automatically every hour. One could spend an entire lifetime doing nothing but absorbing the ever-changing flow of information from the news satellite. So a specific, definite view of a radically different future, which you know, maps reasonably closely to today's internet. Neuromancer, 1984. The sky above the port was the color of television tuned to a dead channel. The future is fundamentally static. Um, if you think of it in terms of uh, philosophy, uh, there sort of are different ways to, to map these quadrants. But I would say the uh, optimistic indeterminate quadrant is fundamentally um, the quadrant of uh, someone like Rawls or Nozick. People normally think of them as opposites, but they're, they're really both in the same ca category. Nozick is sort of the libertarian version. You ha have no idea what to do, and therefore the individual is paramount. Uh, Rawls, um, you're in, in a veil of ignorance. You have no idea what society you will be born in, and therefore social democracy is paramount. You get to very different ideas, but they both take their starting point from sort of complete indeterminacy about the state of the world. Um, the classic determinate one, you could be on the left, you could be on the right, but it was, there was some sort of, sort of uh, Marx, Hegel, all these people where there was, you know, even going back to Bacon or Locke, there was some sort of definite way that things would, uh, would get uh, better and you could sort of work towards a better future in one way or another. Um, and then, of course, you have um, the determinate pessimistic, indeterminate pessimistic, which I think tend to be the more classical ones. The determinate pa pessimistic would be like Plato and Aristotle. There's a definite way things happen, even though there's sort of limits and you can't be too hopeful about technology or really improving the state of the world in any fundamental way. And then probably the classic version of indeterminate pessimism, and I think this is sort of the philosophical category that we're back in, is sort of the Epicurean, Lucretian view of the universe where there is nothing but atoms in the void. The atoms randomly move throughout the void. 
they rump, sometimes bump into each other, stuff happens, eventually they break apart, things fall apart, chance erodes everything. Um, there's nothing specifically you can do that makes any sense. Everything event, um, you know, things sort of all go to pot. Marijuana farming might be a good thing to go into in this world. Um, but basically, uh, this, is actually, uh, this is actually in some ways become uh, the, dominant, uh, the dominant view, and it, and it ends up being sort of strangely stoic because there's really nothing you can do about these larger forces that, uh, that uh, will ultimately buffet you, and the, the most you can hope to achieve is a certain amount of equanimity and indifference about the fundamental um, randomness and meaninglessness of the universe. Um, you know, indeterminacy and death. Um, we think about uh, the process of aging and death very differently from the way we used to. Sort of the classic early science version was that death was a specific problem to be solved. There were specific diseases to solve, specific ways to conquer death. Um, the, 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 the contemporary way to think about it is fundamentally through the prism of insurance, which is, again, sort of indeterminate, more on the pessimistic side. Um, and the main thing we can do is the actuarial math. You know, what is the probability that you are going to die in a given year if you are that old? So if you're 30 years old, you have about a one in a thousand chance of dying in the next year. If you're 80 years old, you have a one in 10 chance of dying in the next year. And, um, and all we can do is sort of describe these, uh, these probabilities. And I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, by the way, that this probabilistic view has nothing to it. I just want to sort of illustrate how it sort of dominates our thinking. And so instead of trying to find a cure for death or a, a solution to the problem of aging, the best we can hope to do is figure out better ways to calculate the probabilities, better ways to give people, sell people various life insurance policies, and, um, and thereby suggest the sort of pseudo-mastery of a, of a process that's fundamentally uh, random and, and indeterminate. Um, of course, you know, the basic problem is that eventually the luck runs out. Oops. Let me, just, let me see how this works. So anyway, um, you know, um, at some point your luck runs out. Um, and so I think, I think this question of whether, um, you know, indeterminate optimism is possible in the long run is this, is this core question. And 
is something like this, this frame that uh, we've had where it's just one coin toss after another. And um, you know, you're probably not gonna die in the next hour or the next six months. You'll probably be lucky. It will it'll probably land heads for the time being. Um, but you, you never think very far about the future. Is that actually an ultimately stable quadrant or not? And so, uh, so you know, if you want to sort of frame this as a general question, it's, you could say, you know, could an iterative process lead, if not to the best of all possible worlds, at least to a world where there's a path of monotonic and potentially never-ending improvement? That's sort of the, the core idea of this, uh, of this world of uh, indeterminate or indefinite optimism. Um, you know, the paradigmatic um, pro-indeterminate um, optimist example is Darwin and Darwin's theory of evolution, where, you know, you basically, over uh, billions of years, develop this uh, proliferation of, uh, of different life forms. And that's sort of the, that's the paradigmatic example that uh, we apply to all these different fields, and we think that things like that work. Now, I, I do think there are some paradigmatic counterexamples. The one that I want to um, sort of highlight is the paradigmatic uh, counterexample of failed indeterminism are, uh, is, is failed cities. And, uh, and you can sort of, uh, you can certainly give uh, various examples. There's, you know, uh, Los Angeles, which probably should have been the greatest city in the United States with, you know, fantastic weather. Uh, and somehow, you know, everything gradually went wrong with the sprawl. LA is still one of the better places in the world. Uh, you know, the, uh, there's the example of Sao Paulo. I was there for a day about a year ago. Uh, it's about a 12-mile drive from the main downtown area to the airport. Um, it takes about 35 minutes if there's no traffic, four hours if there's traffic on the nine-lane highways. Uh, you sort of take the helicopter at dusk, which is sort of endless lines of red-lit uh, cars backed up bumper to bumper. Um, it's sort of 30 million people living in enclaves of a quarter to half a million each. Um, and of course, Sao Paulo is still, you know, vastly better than places like uh, Mumbai or Lagos, Nigeria, or places like that. And uh, if, if you had to sort of give a single reason why the convergence theory of globalization is probably going to fail, is that most cities in the developing world look something like this, and, um, and they will not actually be improved in any incremental step-by-step -step way. Um, Sorry, there's there's no actual incremental way to um, to improve something um, something like this, um, and you know if you look at the populations, most of the people in the world at this point are are uh, living in in these sorts of places. The uh, the sort of policy debates we have at this point are things like economics versus environmentalism, which we we describe as these radically different perspectives on the world, but they're really just differing. Uh, views of uh, different indefinite futures. It's uh, sort of maybe economics can be a little bit more optimistic, environmentalism is a little bit more pessimistic. I, I personally think that as long as that's the frame, um, environmentalism will always win because um, indefinite you know, optimism is unstable. And the ecological critique of economic thinking is that, uh, is that um, the economist says we don't need to think about the environment because people will solve problems every step of the way. And then the counter argument is this, this probably does not work. But of course, the, uh, the issue with both is that somehow you're subject to these, these much, much larger forces. It's the market, it's nature. Um, they're fundamentally uh, sort of random, unknowable, statistical, and, uh, and you can't uh, think about them coherently in one way or another. Um, and of course, this kind of approach is also sort of very endemic to uh, the way people think about when they start businesses, just to sort of segue back to that. Uh, and uh, what one sees most commonly are sort of this, this methodology where you have no idea what you're doing, but um, it should basically be um, a never-ending form of A-B testing. Um, Darwinistic A-B testing might work if you have billions of years, but in practice, uh, you tend to run out of money well before then. And uh, the problem is that somehow the search space um, um, of all businesses is much bigger than the search space of great businesses. So it's somehow the A-B testing, I think, generally is, is a somewhat too inefficient 
process, and there's sort of an iteration process, but you end up with this question, you just end up on some very low-hanging hill where the iteration is we're going to do something that incrementally improves things at every step in time, but you maybe you just end up you know, in a slightly better part of um, an infinitely large slum or something like that, to use the, uh, the failed city example. There's you know, machine learning, and there's sort of all these different ways where you do not think about the future. It's most character strongly characterized, I think, in a way by the very short time horizons. And I think one of the things that's true both on the startup side and the, maybe even more true on the side of people who invest in startups is that uh, anything that takes longer than a year is considered unreal and fake because we can have no opinions about the future and so everything has to be on a super short time horizon and, um, and, uh, and we're sort of dominated by, um, by people who, uh, who do, do these kinds of things. Um, and there's a question, you know, how well, how well does this actually work? And this is, this is, this is the official religion that um, we have today. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm, um, I don't believe in the official religion, um, but I think, uh, you know, I, th I, I just want, uh, I, I want people just to at least be aware that this is, this is the religion, that, uh, that uh, um, it's all statistical, it's all luck driven. And I do think the, uh, the, the most striking thing is that the, the most successful businesses in some ways don't quite seem to fit this pattern, even though, um, you know, we, we end up um, talking about it. And so, you know, the, you know, the, uh, um, you know, after the 2007 crash, we have seen this return to technology, um, but it was characterized by, um, it was most characterized by businesses that had very definite ideas. I think the, the iconic one for, uh, for the last uh, number of years, at least till Jobs passed away, was Apple, which was, of course, um, very much the opposite of, you know, an indeterminate business. Apple was one where there was a multi-year vision of the future that was sort of being executed against. Um, there are legitimate concerns whether it still has that vision now that Jobs is, is no longer there. But that's really what, what is going on. And, um, and of course, that's not really the way we, we typically talk about it. We typically talk about it and we look at, you know, how mean Jobs was to all the employees. And, uh, and so we, you know, there are people I know who are running businesses and they sort of um, hand out, uh, they hand out, hand out books um, describing how bad Jobs was to his employees to make their employees feel better about themselves. And, uh, and so, um, and, and I think the, the real question you need to ask about something like Apple is, you know, why did the people put up with this bad behavior? And I think it was because there was actually this very countervailing uh, narrative of the future that in a determinate world, you know, one of the most important metrics is the robustness of the plan, what I often call the secret plan that you're working against. Um, you know, the, um, the kinds of companies uh, that we've looked at at Founders Fund over the years, the ones that have done best have been ones that have somehow tracked against this, uh, this very, very long-term vision of the future. Um, and I think uh, sort of the one, the one closing thought I would have on this is that um, the one most characteristic thing of, of companies with a plan is that they do not sell. And uh, it, there often are times that you should sell businesses. You know, I started PayPal. There were reasons that we, uh, there were reasons that it was the right decision for us to sell the business um, when we did in, in 2002 to eBay. But, uh, but I do think that the most successful businesses somehow have an idea of the future that's, uh, that's very different from the present. Um, it's not fully valued, and, um, and therefore there is uh, there's no point at, uh, at which you, you should sell. Uh, I've, I've, I've told this anecdote before, but the, uh, the, the most um, important moment in my mind in the, in the history of Facebook um, occurred in July of 2006. Uh, the company had been around for about two years. Um, at the time, it was still just a college site. There were maybe eight or nine million uh, um, people on the site. The revenues were, I think, tracking to about 30 million, no profits. And we got, we received an acquisition offer from Yahoo for a billion dollars. And so we had the uh, board meeting on uh, Monday morning on, um, in July 2006. There were three of us on the board, Zuckerberg, myself, Jim Breyer, um, 
And, um, and you know, full disclosure, I think uh, that both um, Breyer and myself, at, on balance, thought we probably should take the money and run. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, Zuckerberg started the meeting, and first thing he said was, uh, well, you know, um, it's kind of a formality. We have to have a quick board meeting. It shouldn't take more than 10 minutes. You know, we're obviously not going to sell here. Uh, and then we said, well, you know, we should actually talk about this a little bit more. You know, a billion dollars is a lot of money. And we, in some ways, rehashed the entire, uh, the entire uh, discussion we had today here. It was sort of like, you know, um, you know, you own like 25% of the company. There's so much you could do with all the money you'd make. Well, I don't really know what I'd do with the money. Um, you know, I'd, I'd just start another social networking site. But I kind of like the one I already have, so why should I sell? <laughs> and it was in some ways sort of an encapsulation of this, of this, entire, uh, of this entire discussion. And of course, um, you know, you, you never sort of, you know, the, the immediate aftermath was that uh, there was, you know, an almost, you know, infinite number of, uh, not infinite, but there was sort of a large number of, you know, uh, sort of stories about how, you know, how in the world could you have a CEO who was so crazy that he wouldn't sell the company, who didn't know that you should take a billion dollars. This is what you got when you had someone who was 22 years old, when you didn't have any adults in the company. Um, you know, it probably, you know, it was just the worst decision anybody had ever made. Um, the best, the best rash, you know, I was a little bit worried about it. We had our, you know, the, the sort of Founders Fund ideology we had was that uh, we should always back the CEO, we should always back the founder. And so you know, we, we went, we, uh, we just went with, with that as a, as a framework. Um, but I think sort of the one, you know, the one partial uh, rationalization I was able to come up with for not taking the money was that I, you know, we, I looked at the, the history and Yahoo had, um, there had been two other companies where they'd offered a billion dollars that had been turned down. Uh, it was eBay and Google. And, um, and so I concluded that uh, give, at least you, you could actually make a pseudo-scientific argument that, uh, that, uh, that every case where someone had been offered a billion dollars and had rejected it, it had been the correct thing to do. Um, but I, I do think this is, uh, but the, you know, the argument that uh, Zuckerberg finally, you know, finally, uh, finally came, came down on was that uh, um, you know, there were all these new things that we were going to build at Facebook, and it was clear that Yahoo wasn't valuing any of the products that had not yet been released, and he wanted to have a chance to build those products. And since he was pretty confident that Yahoo had, and I, I don't want to this is not an anti-Yahoo thing, this is, I think would be true of almost all these companies, that they had no um, definite idea about the future and therefore did not properly value uh, things that did not yet exist. Um, they were therefore undervaluing, um, undervaluing the business. And I think this is sort of, um, this is sort of um, the challenge all of us have is to, uh, um, to work towards a future that's not just uh, static, like a dead channel on television, but that's, uh, that's a definite future, and that is a radically better future that can, uh, that can motivate and coordinate and inspire um, a number of people to change the world and to go to a world where, we, uh, where, um, where luck is something uh, for us to overcome and to deal with as we, as we go along the way, but, uh, but not uh, for something uh, that becomes uh, this absolute dominating force that, uh, that uh, stops all thought, thought before it even starts. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I'm not going to say best of luck. Thank you.